everyone. So we have about a little bit more than 10 minutes for, for questions. So I hope you have loads of questions. I think there are just a number for you. Does one of you want to, to take the microphone and go wrong this time? I usually do this to who wants to go there. You want to volunteer? So any questions? A good start with Ukraine. We uh, before the class started, we had a, a round table on Ukraine. Mm. And so I've been threatening to upload the whole thing soon, so I will do it on the uh, So, but I think you will be listening uh, to the news, I imagine. So maybe you have some questions about that. Just... Um, thank you for coming. Um, I just wanted to ask, uh, you said your budget was roughly around 500 million per annum. Um, but I saw that you have um, quite a few different projects spread around the world. Um, would you say that the um, European External Action Service is kind of spreading itself too much and spreading kind of that, that funding around that not that much influence can be um, made in these individual projects rather than kind of concentrating, focusing all resources onto a smaller amount of projects? Oh, very good, uh, very good question and point. Um, it's uh, the, the money I was referring to uh, is uh, administrative money. I have to pay my salary to uh, rent my house and to uh, have our embassy here. And it's not uh, the money we spend on projects. Uh, it's not to bore you the details of budgets, but uh, this comes from another pot where. Then identify the development aid you give to the whole of Africa, uh, which I think in itself is close to 900 uh, million euro uh, over the last four to five years. Uh, but it's not coming out of this 500 uh, million budget. So this is, the, I just have a look. Uh, by the way, I brought you this little booklet if you're interested to, to see what we're doing. Um, I just have a look what I have. The overall number we spent on development aid. Um, no, we only have the number for. Oh, yes, we have that. Uh, yes. uh, it's just a number that uh, kind of shows you a bit that we are in a different dimension when it comes to project. We spent 9.5 billion in development aid over the next couple of years. Um, so uh, that's, that's quite a substantial sum. And uh, uh, but thanks for asking the questions. Uh, the money I refer to is simply the uh, one more question, is that okay? Um, uh, with uh, deciding, um, now you have to take into consideration a lot of all the member states' agreements. Um, there are different concerns for each member state. Um, what kind of, how do you conduct, is it by like a majority voting system where, you, where countries decide, all right, yeah, we'll kind of agree on this project, or is it more, are certain member states prioritise more than others, or is it? Um, it's the formal rules are, on which we operate are consensus in foreign policy. In most of the other fields of the European Union, when it comes to the internal market, environmental policy, and purview for environmental policy, we usually operate on the basis of uh, majority voting. But so far, we have not reached that stage in foreign policy yet, partly because we are sending people into one's way and uh, you need to be sure everybody is on board also in terms of the future of the app, of the personnel. Um, okay, she might, yeah, organize this. Um, so we operate on the basis of consensus, which seems more difficult to reach than it actually is, because what you need, especially if you are as many as 28, is some determined leaders who propose something, and then you will come into a negotiation dynamic where some will block the worst them, so what they really cannot live with, but where in the end uh, a lot of decisions can actually be taken uh, to move things along.
long. So it's less difficult to reach consensus than it's done before. What is really difficult is to get consensus to undo something. Because there's usually somebody who profits more than the other and it's not ready to do. So to do something new is not so difficult to find, to find consensus. This is not to say that there are huge differences uh, still in interest uh, between member states. There's no kind of hiding behind it. Uh, and that's why what we do is we negotiate endless negotiations going on in Brussels or before all the ministerial meetings, the council conclusions which uh, we produce are the statements of the European Union on the policy system. They are all negotiated for hours when we try to get closer to positions. And if you, for example, compare where we started on the Middle peace process 10 years ago or 15 years ago and where we are now, it's just leak of the difference, which comes from small little steps of bringing this closer and closer. I don't know how many hours I've spent with this. It's 28 are on the table, and till late at night to twist the words. Um, but that's, that's the way we operate. Slowly, slowly, you kind of create a common understanding of the problem, and then you formulate a solution to it, which doesn't always work. That's also fair to say. In more and more cases, Thank you, Bruno. Um, one thing that's not up on your slide there is the um, treaty level agreement that is, have, was being negotiated or, or is still being negotiated between Australia and the EU. Could you just update us on where those negotiations are? What, what a treaty level agreement is and why it's different from a treaty, what the content of that treaty might be, why it's stuck over the human rights clause, and how the EEAS might contribute to breaking that jam. Um, it is up there. It's the framework agreement. It's the longer title to the framework agreement. Uh, it, it's uh, but the treaty level agreement. A treaty level agreement. The simple uh, now we're going into legality, but uh, the treaty level agreement for the European Union means that you are uh, signing it and ratifying it and ratified by each of the member states. So it's kind of a, a rather heavy procedure to agree it, which signifies a heavy commitment to it. So uh, that's, the, that's kind of the, the legal answer to the, what is a, what's the treaty level agreement. Now, uh, what is in there, I think I covered a bit. Um, it, it is it, it ranges, or it covers the whole range of cooperation between the European Union and, uh, and Australia, starting from the common values, uh, from the rights, from non kind of fight against uh, non population uh, commitments to uh, international norms, goes into the different sectors, environment, foreign policy, environment, taxation, uh, research, uh, border protection, uh, all these issues are covered and it spells out a bit more in detail how we work together and how we will work and want to work together. Now, um, where we, with the negotiations, I think we've completed almost all uh, parts of the, of the text. There's still some outstanding issues on taxation, uh, really for um, and uh, we have uh, still some questions around what we call the institutional provisions. And there, Australia and the European Union are meeting each other from a kind of different direction, where we have certain ways of dealing with the suspension of agreements on the basis of certain clauses. This is something alien to Australian law, uh, where they don't commit twice to similar uh, provisions. Now, where, where are we in, in, in finding a solution? We have a, a task from our two foreign ministers, uh, when uh, shortly after uh, Foreign Minister Fisher took office in September, she met our representative Ashton in New York, and, uh, and, also moved back. And, uh, and they agreed that we should move forward on the, on the negotiations and conclude them uh, being kind of creative solutions. That's what also politicians tell us, diplomats, uh, when they don't find a solution themselves, uh, that, that we should come up with creative solutions. Um, 
and they are out there. I have no doubt that we will that we will find this solution. The point where we are at at the moment is that we are not doing this in isolation. The European Union is negotiating at the same time with other key partners where similar questions are on the table and where the negotiations are slightly more advanced. For example, in Canada, uh, we have now just kind of almost cleaned up the whole text of the trade agreement and the framework agreement. And I think negotiations here uh, kind of will follow a little bit once the Canadian language is dried up. Uh, so this is, is one part of the answer that uh, Australian negotiations are not done in isolation and we will have to make sure that they are in line with others. We have similar agreements with South Korea, with Singapore, um, now with Canada, Canada is almost done, with uh, New Zealand actually, we are, we are close to finalization. So I think this will come a bit in a package and, uh, and we'll have to see how, the, how it finally looks, but I'm, I have no, no major doubts that we will find it. Soviet uh, uh, nature, where they actually um, <coughs> declared independence after the little war that, that Russia raged a couple of years back. Now, they're not incorporated into Russia, like Crimea now is, or uh, has been proclaimed to be. They have declared themselves independent, but the authorities in Tbilisi still consider them as part of Georgia, which also, again, makes it quite difficult to move towards membership Union if your own territory is not sorted out. And in Moldova, unfortunately, again, you have a funny little place, sorry to say, but it's called Transnistria. Um, you might have never heard of this, but it's again a, a region within Moldova, as small as this place is, it's even a smaller place within, it's called Transnistria, with a separate government backed by the Russians with Russian military presence on the ground, still dating back from Soviet times. So what we call this post-Soviet space uh, remains messy. It's not going to be a quick way to uh, enlarge it now because people realize, ah, oh, uh, we might uh, kind of have a more assertive Russian That's also why 
as European Union, right from the beginning, we have made clear and clear again our purpose or our objective is not to escalate this conflict and to stand up to Russia and uh, kind of show the arms. We would like to find negotiated solutions because we, can, we don't believe that in any other way we would find uh, uh, we would find a solution in this what we call common neighborhood. We always call it common neighborhood. The Russians never liked this. They always thought this is kind of part of their sphere of influence. Now coming to the customs union, I just think it's an impact. And if the customs union was the goal of Putin, Crimea was a big own goal, because how would he ever consider now here making the decision to join the customs union uh, after Russia invaded part of the territory in violation of bilateral treaties where Russia was a security guarantee, a guarantor. In Ukraine. So I don't see any any near prospect of Ukraine as a whole joining the customs union. And if the purpose of the customs union was to just have Crimea as part of it, then I'm doubtful about the economic uh, rationale. But many other doubts about the economic rationale of the customs union in Belarus and Kazakhstan. Um, but uh, it's a curious I would never claim not to have a deep understanding of the motives of the, of the current Russian leadership. But if the customs union was the goal, this was certainly not a smart move to take. Thank you very much. Uh, this would be the, the last question, but the uh, room is going to join us for the wrong people. Yes. At the moon. We are now going to go upstairs uh, to the seventh floor for the video conference with Nina Morgan. Okay? So you have about 10 minutes. Um, and then I have one more time. Also, excellent work.